Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, Knife Handle 101. So today I'm going to show the making of a bunch of different knife handle types. What I'm focusing on here is not the design per se, you know, how they look and all the little nuances of how to finish them, but how they're actually constructed. So the point here is not to show every little picky detail of the construction, but to show the overall logic of how they're made, how everything fits together. The idea is that, you know, this will give you a kind of wide range of knife handle types and you can see what's going to be most appropriate for the particular kind of knife that you're working on. So I'm going to start with probably the most common type of handle found on modern knives and this is mostly used on stock removal knives, that is knives that are ground to shape rather than hammered into shape and that's the full tang or through tang type of handle. The basic idea is very simple here. You take a flat slab of material, could be wood, bone, antler, some kind of engineered material like micarta or carbon fiber, whatever. Then you use a fastener and maybe epoxy to hold it on the flat tang of a knife. The simplest approach is to use pins, but you can use screws, corby fasteners, rivets, all kinds of different things. In this case, I'll be using tube rivets, which are basically just stainless steel tube that I'll flare at the end to lock everything together with. Here I'm starting with one of my Tactics Armory blades, the Shadow model. The tang, that's the handle part, is absolutely dead flat, so that anything that mates to it needs to be dead flat too, and then everything will fit together correctly with no gaps. For the handle slabs, I'm using canvas micarta, cut to size from large sheets. Then I'll drill the holes in succession to exactly fit the ones on the shadow, using a pin to orient them and make sure the holes line up. That's the whole key here. Those holes have got to be dead square, dead straight, and in exactly the right place. You want to make sure that the front edge is situated where you want it and then it's been profiled however you want it. Then in go the rivets. Which are flared with an arbor press. Next, I'll grind off the excess and profile everything so as to shape it to its final shape on my belt grinder. So general note here, I've got tons of knife projects on my channel, so if you have a particular approach that you want to take after watching this video, check out the playlist in the cards or the description and you'll be able to find much more comprehensive examples of just about every type of fastener that you can think of, as well as more complex handles with bolsters and other features that are beyond the scope of this video. And here's the end result. Hey guys, let me jump in here with a shout out for our sponsor, Grizzly Industrial. If you don't know them, you should. Grizzly is a supplier of a huge range of woodworking and metalworking tools. In fact, you'll see me using my Grizzly 14-inch bandsaw, that's the GO555, and my disc sander, the G7297, extensively on this video. But I actually own four or five Grizzly tools, you know, kind of major tools. That's not counting all the little stuff that I've bought from them over the years. And all of it was bought before they ever sponsored any of my videos. If you want to find out more about Grizzly or just get some tips about woodworking or metalworking, uh, they've got a great channel on YouTube, tons of information about various tools that they sell, tips, tricks, how to set them up, maintenance, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, links in the description so you can jump over and subscribe to the Grizzly channel 
And of course, when you want to buy Grizzly tools, grizzly.com. By the way, if you're interested in either of the tools, the Grizzly tools that I used here today, uh, for a limited time, uh, the coupon code right here is good for 10% off of either the bandsaw or the disc grinder or disc sander that I'm using today. Next, we're going to turn to handle types that are typically, but not always, used on forged knives. Now, quick note, all the rest of these handles are going to be put on this little dummy setup right here. It doesn't even have a blade, as you can see. It's just a steel bar that's kind of a stand-in for a real blade, so that you can see how it all works. Most forged knives have some variant of a hidden tang, meaning that the tang of the knife is completely encased within the handle. But beyond that, there are a number of ways of holding everything together. We're using this dummy tang here to demonstrate several variants. As you can see, it has notches milled in to demarcate the tang and separate them from the blade. You can file these in using a file guide, or you can mill them. The end result is exactly the same. Typically, hidden tang knives have some kind of metal guard. To save wear and tear on my sensitive girlish fingers, as well as to save time, I'm going to fabricate a dummy guard from aluminum, though more typically they're made from brass. Of course, you can use Damascus steel, stainless, silver, wrought iron, whatever. I'm milling the slot, then cleaning up the shoulders with a file. Guards often come pre-made, but if you want to make one yourself and you don't have a mill, you can drill a series of holes and then file everything out. It's more time consuming, but in the end you get the same result. Now I should mention all the parts in this video are going to be made from cheap, soft materials, and I'm not going to properly finish anything. Again, all we're trying to do here is demonstrate the basic construction methods, not make anything really resembling a finished knife. In this particular case, I'm going to cap the handle with a pommel, which will be peened into place. To make that work, I'll grind a thin cylinder at the end of the tang, which will fit through the hole in this aluminum pommel that I've fabricated. Once it can be press fit onto the handle, I'll make a sandwich handle. This would most typically be wood, though in this case I'm taking a shortcut and using micarta again. As with everything in this video, I'm cheating. Here, using the super glue. In real life, I'd actually use epoxy. Well, truthfully, I just flat wouldn't use micarta for this particular application at all. I'd definitely use wood, but that's another story. Once it's glued up, I'll trim the ends on the bandsaw. Then flatten them on the disc sander so that they mate dead perfectly, both flat and square, to the guard. On goes the pommel. Then, after trimming that little extension on the tang, I'll peen down the end. This is the kind of technique that you'd see on antique daggers, medieval swords, things of that nature. Very, very old school. This technique's been used literally for a thousand years. In real life, I'd shape all the parts before assembly. In this case, though, I'll demonstrate that on the next handle. Here's the general idea though. Very crude, obviously, but you see where I'm going with it. Okay, so next, a variant on this same approach. In this case, however, we'll skip the peening and use a threaded pommel. This is a popular approach for cast sculptural type pommels. Dragons, wolf heads, all that kind of thing. It's great for fantasy swords, medieval blades, wall hangers, all kinds of things. You can buy cast pommels with threaded holes in them 
from many different knife supply places. In this case, instead of using the existing material, we'll actually be brazing an extension onto our tang. So I've ground off that little extension that we used before, and I'll be actually adding a piece of welding rod. Now why would you do this? Why wouldn't you just shape it all from the same piece of steel? Well, if you're using, say, Damascus steel, you can save possibly three or four inches of extremely expensive material and replace it with a cheapo steel. I'm going to be using silver solder. Strictly speaking, this is a brazing process, not soldering, but nobody calls it that. They call it silver solder. You could also do this with brass as your brazing material. Basically, I'm just fluxing up the tang, then heating it to somewhere in the neighborhood of 1500 Fahrenheit, at which point the solder flows, filling the joint. Contrary to what you might think, brazed joints are actually quite strong. So as long as you do it right, there's no danger of things falling apart here. It's essentially as strong as if you had made the whole thing from one piece of steel. After cleaning all the flux and crud off the extension, I'll thread it with a threading die. Once that's accomplished, I'll finish the component parts. We're harvesting the handle material from the previous handle, this time finishing it correctly so that it mates properly into the guard. Same goes with the guard, which will be marked to mate with the micarta. How this little joint works out totally depends on the design of the knife. There are a lot of different ways of doing it. After we've got everything shaped properly, then we'll fit it together, thread on the pommel, and blend everything on the grinder. So what if we don't want a pommel at all? In the case of Bowie's and many other old-fashioned forged knives, the tang is 100% enclosed within the handle. This hidden tang approach offers the most flexibility in terms of handle shapes and sizes, as it's not limited in any dimension by the shape or size of the tang. Here we'll use the sandwich technique again, but this time we'll mark and then cut the center section on the bandsaw so that it fits the tang very tightly. Next, we'll glue it up, just like we did the previous handle. Again, the mark of a good handle of this type is a really tight joint between the guard and the handle material, so I'll carefully grind this flush on the sander. You always want to leave a hair of extra space toward the end of the handle cavity. If you don't, you may grind too much material off the face here, and then you're stuck with a gap between the guard and the wood. So always leave that little extra wiggle room. Typically, you'll hold the whole thing together with a cross pin. So once you've got everything assembled, you can go ahead and glue it up, or you can drill the hole for your cross pin and then glue and assemble the whole thing at one time. It's up to you. Personally, I like drilling the hole after it's glued up. As with the previous methods, you want to make sure that the joint between your guard and your handle material has been finished to whatever degree is necessary before assembly. If that sounds a little vague, the reason is that different guards and finishing techniques will give you different amounts of access to the contact wheels on your grinder, to files, to whatever tools you're using. If it's just a flat-faced cross guard, you just need to finish the wood part and then assemble it. However, if it's a guard that blends into the handle seamlessly, you may need to have everything near perfect before assembly. Again, it really depends on the design. So here's how this particular dummy works out.
So I hope you picked up some good stuff here. Like I said earlier, I'll put links in the cards and in the description down here to a bunch of my knife builds that will show examples of knives made using many of the techniques that I've shown here in a lot more detail. Uh, there are a lot of little tips and a lot of little tra traps and tricks and stuff that will you have to sort of navigate to get these things to work right. So by all means, if there's a particular handle you're interested in, check out some of those other videos that have a lot more information in them. All right, thanks, and see you soon. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Link's in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!